I will talk about tax loss harvesting. And uh, this was a presentation I made to the San Francisco Boogleheads chapter uh, a few months back and uh, led to a good discussion. Uh, I will not be covering every aspect of it, but try to keep the key parts in. I also definitely will bring a Boogleheads point of view to it and we can discuss for eternity what being a Boogalhead means, but or what those principles are, but um, hopefully we all agree on many of them. So sometimes you may see things that are not strictly tax loss harvesting, but tax loss harvesting for a Boogalhead. So with that, let me get started. So I will read uh, a little from the slide so that you don't have to read every word, uh, but essentially what is tax loss harvesting? Tax loss harvesting is a way uh, if if you have investments that you purchase some time back and they are their current value is lower than what you acquired them for, there can be a tax benefit that you can get. This is a current tax benefit, and I'll explain what current means. It usually means for the current year. It is meaningful only in taxable accounts. Um, any tax sheltered accounts such as uh, your traditional Roth 401ks or traditional Roth IRAs, 403bs, et cetera. Any tax sheltered accounts, if you do have the situation I just mentioned, which is your investments are now worth less than what you paid for them, tax loss harvesting is not relevant for those. It's only meant for taxable accounts. Um, there are some implications of holding the same securities in your tax sheltered accounts, and I'll get to that, but that's where we are. Now, I'll, I'll get to... Uh, a Boogleheads requirement, which is not by itself a tax loss harvesting issue, but it's something you just want to keep in mind, which is tax loss harvesting is the icing on the cake. It's not the cake itself. The investment decision is the cake itself. So what we are, one, one key assumption that I will have as we go through this is that your portfolio, even after tax loss harvesting, will remain at its target asset allocation. Um, and what, what as sort of bringing forward a comment that I'll probably make later, which is you don't want to tax loss harvest, keep some things in cash to avoid some taxes and then go back later on. That's market timing. Um, our approach is whatever asset allocation you have decided is appropriate for you, you're not going to change it because of this, uh, this activity. So, so what do you do? Uh, what, does, what does tax loss harvesting involve? So basically what you will do is you would sell an investment and immediately invest its proceeds in what IRS calls a similar but not substantially identical asset. So um, there are some examples on the Bogleheads Wiki, uh, which I'll give the link to uh, in, in the last slide of this presentation, which tells what some pairs of funds are that many folks consider similar but not substantially identical. There are interpretations on these, and um, I'm not sure IRS has explicitly ruled what can or cannot be called similar but not substantially identical, but sometimes you can follow logic. If you say, I have um, a class A share or one kind of a share of uh, the Vanguard 500 index, and I sell that and I buy, buy another one of the same fund, those I would consider substantially identical. Uh, but if you think of individual securities, um, an example would be Ford Motor Company and General Motors. They are impacted a lot by similar kind of factors, but they are definitely not identical securities. Um, one last point, which is a little detail, is if you have been keeping track or your broker has been keeping track of the specific lots that you acquired, uh, that makes it simpler to some extent to, uh, or to optimize your tax loss harvesting. If you don't, then a broker may be carrying it at an average cost or some other similar way. You can still tax loss harvest. It just may not be quite as valuable. So what, what are the advantages? So the advantages 
of tax loss harvesting are, let's say you acquired a security for make up a number $10,000. And now it's worth only $9,000. And you follow the approach that we had earlier, which is you sell it for $9,000. So let's say it was Ford Motor Company. You sold it for $9,000. You had a loss for $1,000. Immediately that $9,000, you went ahead and invested it in General Motors. So you say, I'm still fully invested, but now I have a tax loss. That capital loss, it can first be used to reduce any capital gains that you have elsewhere in your portfolio. So in my example, it was a $1,000 loss, but suppose it had been a $100,000 loss and you have gains that are bigger than that, uh, then you can use this capital loss to reduce your current year capital gains. Once you've reduced those, you can use any capital loss that's still remaining to reduce $3,000 of ordinary income, which could be your wage income, or it could be your dividends that you get, interest from your bank, and so on. And if you still have capital losses left once you left over once you have done both these things, then you can carry these forward and do the same thing in future years. Um, so, so this lets you take a current year tax benefit and it lets you defer capital gains to future or the taxes on capital gains to future. And when you have deferred it, firstly, of course, there's a time value of money, which is paying something in future costs less paying that something right now. Uh, that's, that's one advantage. But the tax law also has some other advantages, which it may be a little morbid, but just to be aware, um, there's a concept of stepped up basis. If anyone inherits these securities that you now have in your portfolio on which you expect to owe future gains uh, or future taxes and future gains, on the death of the owner, the inheritance inherited securities are considered stepped up in basis, which means you do not owe capital gains. So now you have taken a tax benefit in the current year for the loss. You expected to pay future tax gains, but one of you passed away uh, and whoever inherited it no longer has to pay taxes. So that's, that's a nice free lunch. Uh, another one is if you donate those appreciated shares to charity, again, you would not owe taxes on those additional capital gains. One key advantage I see as a bogle head, certainly I, I did it myself about 20 years back, uh, back at the time of the dot-com burst, was if you became a bogle head and you had some securities where you said, if I, if I now simplify my portfolio or otherwise try to get to some target that's different from what I used to do in past, uh, if I had been worried about the tax cost of that. Well, if in the current year, your securities are worth less than they were when you acquired them, this gives you a chance to do that rebalancing or to simplify your portfolio at lower costs. So that's a little bit of an advantage. Um, of course, your portfolio will look different than what you start out with, but hopefully you'll end up at your target portfolio without a significant tax cost. Going to disadvantages now. So in the example I gave you, which was you had bought Ford Motor Company stock at $10,000. It had gone down to 9,000. You sold it for nine, turned it around and bought General Motors stock for 9,000. Well, now your tax basis in your investments is only $9,000. That's what you have paid for the securities you now hold. Uh, earlier, you had paid $10,000 for it. The effect of that is in future, your capital gains are going to be higher. Your taxes in future are going to be higher. So you have not avoided taxes. You've just pushed them out to the future. So, so keep that in mind that this is not a complete, oh, I have avoided taxes. I've only got a current year benefit and I know I likely will pay taxes in future. The second uh, or one of the other things to keep in mind is 
typically you're doing tax loss harvesting when there are dips in the market. And a dip basically means whatever you acquire will be at a lower price than I'll call its usual price. Of course, there's no guarantee that it'll ever come back to its usual price, but definitely you bought it at a dip. And if you think, oh, I'll go ahead and I'll acquire, uh, I'll buy this new security at this low price. And later on, I don't really want to hold it. I'll turn around and buy what I really want to buy. Well, you are likely to be locked in because in future prices, hopefully will be higher than what you bought it at. And so it does lock you in. So be very sure of what you're buying into, not just what you're getting out of, but buying into, you may be holding it for a very long time. One other factor to keep in mind, of course, and that you will be able to tell by looking at your own portfolio, but as a general principle, as stock prices or as whatever security you're holding, as they are marching upwards most of the time uh, in value or in price, your tax loss harvesting cannot be done with very old shares. If you bought at and shares 20 years back or 30 years back, likely there, I have no idea by the way what at and shares go for, but likely they are higher price today. So you can't do tax loss harvesting with something you bought 30 years ago, most likely. You'll probably do tax loss harvesting with something that you bought more recently. So that's also something to think about. Um, finally, one, one thing you want to make sure is you, when you try to reduce taxes, of course our temptation always is to reduce current year taxes. But a lot of the time what you really want to aim for is reducing your total tax, current plus future. Uh, so there are scenarios where your current taxes may go lower because of tax loss harvesting, but your future taxes could be higher. So let's, let's go over those. Tax laws could change. Future tax rates could be significantly higher. Right now, capital gains tax uh, rates are lower than ordinary income. That was not always the case. Um, so who knows, the gains that you have in future, uh, you may be paying higher taxes for that. As a boglehead, I will say, you, to a fair extent, you should not be planning for what you think tax laws will be. Tax laws will be. Um, until they're actually passed, uh, they are a big unknown. Uh, sometimes you can guess at it. You can say, okay, this, right now the tax laws uh, or tax rates are at their historically lowest they've ever been. And I can imagine in future, the governments will need to raise taxes. Okay, that's, that's a reasonable assumption, but be aware of your assumption. So I would not do too much planning on tax laws changing in future, just based on some conjecture. But then there's a second scenario, which is you may be early in your career, or at least you may be at a relatively low point right now in tax rates, and you expect your future income to be higher. That can be true for younger folks, but it can be true for many other folks who have a pretty clear picture on, hey, this year was an exception. Um, I decided to take a break from work. I'm not working uh, for you know, six months of the year. Uh, or I was unemployed uh, uh, involuntarily. And uh, either way, I expect my taxable income to be low, my tax rates to be low. This is an opportunity in that case, if you expect that next year, you will be in higher rates. So that's something to keep in mind though, that in such a scenario, tax loss harvesting could end up hurting you because you probably would have paid lower taxes um, without those tax loss harvesting. Uh, one other thing, and this is, very relevant for California folks is um, if, if you're temporarily outside of California and you plan to move back to California and you're in a state which has lower taxes right now, well, tax loss harvesting then sets you up where you take the tax benefit. Let's say you are in the state of Washington and you're paying zero income tax and you do tax loss harvesting. So you take a tax loss and that lets you deduct your losses 
at the federal rate and the state rate, but the state rate is zero. And now your basis in the investments you own now has gone down. Then let's say a year from now, you know you're going to move back to California. And a year from now, you move back to California and you turn around and sell what you had acquired in this year. Now you will be paying not just the federal taxes, but also California taxes. So keep that in mind that tax loss harvesting isn't automatically a good thing. Um, there can be scenarios where you may be better off not doing tax loss harvesting. I'll talk a little bit about how you do this or the process of it, or some things to keep in mind. If you're doing tax loss harvesting where you're selling a mutual fund and then you're turning around and buying into an equivalent but not identical mutual fund, usually mutual funds are bought at the end of the day at 4 p.m. Eastern time. That's a price that'll apply. So the two events would be simultaneous. So let's say, just as an example, I'm not saying that's what you should do, but let's say you had Vanguard Total Stock Market Fund, you had losses in that, you're selling it and you're buying Vanguard 500 index. You, you've decided the two are equal enough from your point of view for whatever reason. When you do that, uh, the sale of the Vanguard uh, Total Stock Market and the purchase of the uh, Vanguard 500 will happen simultaneously at 4 p.m. That's a good thing. With ETFs, there will need to be a lag between the two transactions. Uh, ETFs trade all during the day. So let's say you, you put in the order during the uh, market day, it will sell. And depending upon the broker, they will allow you to use those unsettled funds. And what it means is the sale goes through, but you don't have the funds available to you for a couple more days but the broker may allow you to use those future funds to go ahead and buy your second investment. There may be a lag between the two. And if the market is very volatile, you may lose out or you may um, not get exactly what you are looking for. Keep that in mind when you're thinking of the benefits from tax loss harvesting. And with individual stocks, one other thing that will, uh, and ETFs, one other thing that happens is there's a bid ask spread, meaning what you sell it for and what you buy it for, even the same security, you do lose uh, to transaction costs. So it's not, it doesn't come for completely free. And what I haven't mixed here is the third thing, which is you could be selling a mutual fund to buy an ETF or vice versa. And let's say you sell a mutual fund. Well, the mutual fund, complete only at 4 p.m. Eastern, which means after the market closes. So you likely will have to wait till the next day to buy the, the replacement security. And again, volatility could hurt you. So that's something to keep in mind as you do tax loss harvesting. Um, some studies I have seen say, uh, and I want to leave this, uh, I'll go to the next slide in a moment, but I'll want to leave everyone with that thought that Tax loss harvesting is a great idea. It is icing on the cake. Keep the cake in mind. And when I say the cake, keep your investment approaches in mind when you're doing all this. Um, I have seen studies which say tax loss harvesting can improve your returns by 20 to 50 basis points. That sounds great. It does require everything goes perfectly. These scenarios I have told you where your future tax rates go up, there's volatility, there's a bit of spreads. Some of these things will take away from that benefit. So, so you need to keep that in mind. Some other considerations, um, and these are some of these are, are, are personal uh, opinions more than anything else. Um, one is how frequently. You certainly don't need to be doing it every, every moment. Um, you can probably look at market depths. Um, you know, a, there's some examples I'm giving is 2001. Uh, we had the dot-com bust, 2008, the great uh, financial crisis, 2020, when we had the COVID, very sudden dip. And then uh, 2022, when uh, we've seen um, uh, security prices go down. You don't need to do it too often. Uh, usually you can generate enough losses that uh, you can carry forward for a while. There are some gotchas. Um, I'll mention one of them, 
Uh, and if I have time, I'll go over a couple others. But one of those is that you cannot buy and sell the same investment within the 30 day period before and after this, this tax loss harvesting event. Uh, so that 61 day period, if you do it, it's considered a wash sale. And wash sale basically means you cannot, uh, it will be disallowed as, as a tax uh, loss for your tax purposes. If you do it, if you do your buying, uh, uh, your selling of uh, the uh, selling of the security and the buying of the replacement at the same broker, the break, broker likely will catch that it's a wash sale. Even if a broker does not catch it, let's say you do the selling in, uh, in your brokerage account and you do the buying in your 401k, that's also disallowed. Um, I have heard uh, some conservative um, opinions of folks, which is pretty much any account that you or a family member controls. I'll start with anything you control, uh, which uh, of course means your accounts, but sometimes can also mean accounts of uh, a minor child. Uh, but I have heard it extended to a family member. So if you sell something and you're spouse buy something else in their account that also could be considered a watch sale. Again, I leave it up to you uh, because this is not something uh, I can give uh, a guarantee on that IRS will accept or will not disallow, but uh, you need to be aware of it. Um, it's easy to watch out for all these uh, things and just make sure, hey, I'm not playing games here. I do have a loss and I do want to replace it with my, my current security with something similar, but not identical. Because of this 30 day wash rule, uh, one thing that sometimes you can get tripped up by is if you have automatic dividend reinvestment. Uh, because you may decide I'm not buying anything in this 30 day period, but let's say that security declares you have a mutual fund or an ETF, it declares, or, or even uh, an individual security, individual company stock, and they declare a dividend and your broker automatically reinvests it. Well, that's the automatic reinvestment is considered a purchase. So you'll want to make sure that you switch from automatic to manual if you want to do that. Another thing you'll want to do is you don't want to avoid a wash sale and say, oh, you know, I'm going to avoid the wash sale by selling this, sit on cash for 30 days and then buy the same thing back again because that's really what I want to own. Then you are making an investment decision and you are changing your asset allocation from the normal amount of cash that you expected to hold to a higher amount of cash. A Boglehead philosophy, or at least my own philosophy is, you should not be doing that. Your sale and purchase of replacement should be happening close to simultaneously. There are other gotchas. Uh, one of them relates to uh, qualified dividends. Um, if you hold a mutual fund for fewer than 60 days uh, or fewer than 61 days, I think 60 days or less, uh, or maybe 59 days, either way, if you hold it for less than 60 days and it has a qualified dividend distribution, well, it's not considered qualified if you held it for, if you held a mutual fund for fewer than 60 days. So keep that in mind. Those are details. I don't expect they impact most folks, but if you're trading, trading often, which again, a Google head normally should not be, uh, then I would not expect uh, this to be hurting you too much. Um, one other thing that I have not put on the slide is um, if you do have capital losses, they will carry forward indefinitely. But if you die, your capital losses die with you. Um, so you do want to use up those capital losses and not just carry them indefinitely. I, and again, I'm not saying use your life expectancy as a model, but that's something to keep in mind that capital losses uh, can be carried forward, but there is a time limit to them. One last subject that I have not covered here, uh, it's, the reverse of this, it's called tax gain harvesting. All I'll say is you can do it if you are temporarily in a low capital gains tax environment and you expect future rates to be higher and you hold securities that are appreciated. 
Well, what you can do is you can sell the security, turn around and buy them immediately. There is no wash sale issue with tax gains. IRS will let you recognize gains immediately. So let's say you have Ford Motor Company stock that you bought at $1, today it's at 20. You sell it for 20, you have a $19 gain. You turn around a moment later and buy it for $20. Now your tax basis is $20. You have a $19 gain, but if you are in a low to zero capital gains bracket for this year, then you pay zero capital gains tax on that gain. But now in future, when you sell that Ford Motor Company stock, its cost will be $20, not the $1 that you had paid in past. So something to think about, but again, tax gain harvesting is something I haven't covered in, at all in this presentation. Um, finally, this is something I probably have biases, but I will uh, point those out. Uh, you do hear about direct indexing and sometimes um, uh, robo-advisors who say they can take advantage of these tax loss harvesting opportunities. I'll, I'll start with the comment I made earlier, which was tax loss harvesting, uh, the studies show that they can add to your uh, uh, investment performance by a few basis points, by less than maybe a half a percent. I, I'm not saying that's a number you will get, but it, it may not be significant. But you do see it as a selling point for direct indexing. Um, so, and, and for uh, robo advisors for direct indexing. Um, so yeah, um, direct indexing is where, uh, let's say instead of owning S&P 500 fund, um, you have somebody uh, who says there's reasons to hold the underlying securities, uh, maybe because you don't want to invest in some specific components of that uh, of that index. So, so uh, an investment advisor is able to acquire all the individual securities for you. And then they say, hey, when we have, even though S&P 500 hasn't gone down in aggregate, there may be securities in it which have gone down. So to make up an example, in 2001, let's say you owned Enron uh, or you owned S&P 500, and I don't know if Enron was part of it, I imagine it was, but let's say Enron was part of it. And suppose direct in indexing had been available at that time. And instead of owning S&P 500 fund, you owned all the individual securities and Enron was one of those that you owned. 2002 came around and S&P 500 is, is higher than where it was at the end of 2001, but Enron has gone down. And so you could sell the Enron stock individually and, and do a tax loss harvesting. So that sounds like a pretty cool thing. The issue is sort of the same that I've mentioned earlier, which is the icing on the cake versus the cake itself. This tax loss harvesting provides you the icing on the cake. But what now happens is now your basis of the remaining securities that you have are lower um, after that tax loss harvesting. And so now you can't sell out of those, or at least selling out of the, those securities has a higher cost than it had if you had not done tax loss harvesting. And so now you can't leave that investment advisor because, well, you can't sell out and uh, move that cash somewhere else. So now you need either somebody else who's willing to accept all those securities in kind. And if you can't, then you're stuck with that investment advisor who may charge you other costs to stay with them. Also, if you, have, if you are doing direct indexing, there may be a lot of other activity that's going on, which is not even trading related, which could be there are mergers, there are spin-offs, there are other tax events, and you, you'll get a 1099 for every individual security you own. And your tax preparer may not love it, or may, they may love it and they may charge you for loving it. Um, for all those 500 securities that come through. So again, my point being, don't let this tax tail uh, wag the investment dog. Tax loss harvesting is nice, but it should not be making you do things which are otherwise not in alignment with your, with your investment philosophy. Uh, same thing with, with robo-advisors. Uh, I like robo-advisors. They make it simpler to do um, investing, especially when you're starting out. Uh, I, I, of course, with the Bogleheads philosophy, three funds, you don't even need, uh, but that's a separate uh, item to discuss. But the point though is the same, which is you could do tax loss harvesting, 
but it will get you a little bit of a benefit. If it causes you all the other negatives, you'll want to keep that in mind. So I think I'm getting to the end of um, my presentation. Uh, there is the Bogleheads wiki on tax loss harvesting. You can take a look at that. It gives some examples of funds that are uh, substitute funds uh, where you may hold one security and you want to hold something very similar, but that IRS would not consider, consider substantially identical. There are some examples of that. I'll, I'll show a couple of charts real quick. I was going to use them as backup, but I know during the presentation, I'm, I may not pull them up, but let me show you a couple of them. So uh, one of these is, look at the total stock market index fund uh, from about 2001 till right now. And you can see it has gone up and down, but in general, it's March has been upwards. So say you were in on March, I, I took this out on March 3rd. So let's say you were in March 3rd, it was $97. So you could certainly do tax loss harvesting because you might have shares that you bought in the last few months for more than $97. But see how, over time, once you get beyond or past uh, 2021, there wasn't a time when there were any shares that would have cost you more than $97. So the only shares you're really able to sell are the ones you would have bought in the last year and a half or so. Uh, these opportunities do come up in 2020, it came up. You can see in 2020, you could have sold shares that you, you bought any time before 2017 or so. Um, there are dips that happen and you, you can always, the good part is I'm showing you a general principle. You can look at your own securities and see, hey, are there any securities which at this moment are selling for less than what I bought them for? And you could do tax loss harvesting. But in general, with an upward march, there isn't too much opportunity you get um, for selling old shares, at least, I, I do have a counter example that I will show you in a moment. The counter example is the Vanguard Total International Stock Index Fund. And I, that's not over 20 years, it's over 10 years, but you can see it, it has done a lot more going up and down. It has not been marching upwards. Uh, that's not a reason to go out and buy it. Um, the reason is not, you don't go out and buy something to say, I want to do tax loss harvesting with that. You go out and buy hoping it'll be making you money in future and it'll be worth more than what you paid it for. Tax loss harvesting in that sense is backward looking. It's, hey, my, my strategy was good. I know or I expect that in future it will go up, but at this moment it's lower than what I paid it for. Paid for it. Um, in hindsight, you would not have wanted to own Vanguard Total International Stock Fund because it has gone up and down. I, I will tell you myself, I have owned it for all this period and a lot longer. And I do plan to own it because my expectation is, and that's the reason I hold it, that it diversifies my portfolio. And uh, I do expect it to make more money. Um, but now I'll show you the same chart with a substitute security that I used. So I had the ETF for Vanguard Total International Stock Fund, which was the Vanguard VXUS. Um, that's an ETF, but the same fund. Uh, and the substitute I used, and let me show you the next slide, is in red color, it's the IXUS, which is the iShares uh, US, uh, sorry, I, I, iShares International uh, Fund. It is based on a different index. Uh, Vanguard's, uh, I believe, was based on FTSE and iShares was on MSCI, but either way, you can see they, they don't appear to behave. They, they move somewhat in tandem, but not identically. You can clearly see that the red line behave differently than the blue line at various periods. And in fact, you can see if, if you were holding it for the period from 2011 through right now, the Vanguard Total International Fund would have given you a 13.94% return. Um, the IXUS would have given you 16.96. That's not advice to go out and buy IXUS, the iShares. I'm just saying they did behave differently and that would be at least one support for saying these are similar but not substantially identical.